Good afternoon. This is Carol Bauer from the Minnesota Department of Health, Healthcare Homes Program, and I'd like to welcome you to Risky Business, One Healthcare Systems Model of Risk Stratification. Our speaker today is Jill Swenson from uh, Sanford Health, an integrated health system headquartered in South Dakota. Jill helped develop Sanford's advanced patient medical home and team-based care model and recently created a robust risk stratification model, which you will hear about today. Jill has a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Jamestown and is a certified case manager through the Commission for Case Manager Certification. She has over 20 years of nursing experience in care management and case management. Before we turn the presentation over to Jill, I'd like to invite your questions through the chat function throughout the webinar. We'll address as many as we can in, during the last 10 minutes. And the webinar ends at 12.45. Jill, we're going to turn it over to you at this time. Welcome. We're glad you're with us. Great. Thanks, Carol. Can you guys hear me okay? We're good. Okay. Sounds good. So, perfect. I have control here. So. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to join you and talk about risk stratification today. Um, I'm really excited about this topic. I've done a lot of work at Sanford, and, and for any of you on that were at the Learning Collaborative um, at Learning Days in, I believe it was in April of this past year, um, we were there from Stanford Health, and so I did a very similar presentation there. Uh, in collaboration with a clinic system from um, Alexandria, uh, Minnesota, too. So um, I'm hoping we, I can just elaborate a little bit more on what our process has been and um, kind of what our journey is with risk stratifying our patients. Um, so these are the learning objectives. I'm hoping you can walk away with identifying some key components on how to stratify your patient population and provide some examples of how your healthcare organization can implement care management strategies to support your high risk and complex patient um, population. So this is a little bit about Sanford Health. Um, like Carol said, we are a large integrated health system. We're headquartered in South Dakota. Uh, we are currently one of the largest rural non-for-profit health systems um, in the United States. We have 44 medical centers, 482 clinics. We recently uh, merged with Good Samaritan Center, so we now have 242 senior living uh, facilities. And we're growing all the time. Uh, we also have some world clinics. Um, so we are in nine states and nine different countries. So we have some world health clinics in Costa Rica, Ireland, Germany, Ghana, South Africa, China, Vietnam, and New Zealand. Uh, so that's really exciting um, work that we have been doing here at Stanford. So today we're going to talk about risk stratification. There's a lot of different models out there for risk stratification. There's a lot of information. Um, so hopefully this kind of just perks your interest a little bit today and um, gives you kind of a starting point as to where you can go with your clinic um, or practice. Really the goal of risk stratification is to identify patients that will benefit from care management. As a system at Sanford, we've had a lot of discussions about um, is this a predictive tool? So are we predicting something and if we are, what is it? So a lot of our clinicians will come back to us from the care management side and say, well, you know, what's the predictive model here? Like, what are we predicting? Are we predicting ED um, visits? Are we predicting risk for admission? And, and we're not. So the goal of risk stratifying your patient population um, that we have in place is really just to identify those patients that can benefit from care management. So how can we link them into services? How can we improve their health outcomes? How can we look at their utilization? Um, generally, overall, how can we just improve them? Um, so like I said, why risk stratify? It's giving you that population health approach. So what are those actionable um, view into the needs of your patient population? So it, it may be that you know we need to tie our patients into different services. Um, so it may be 
they need a social worker, they need behavioral health therapy, they need an RN care manager, uh, they need dietitians. You know, it, it's, it's your whole care team that we're looking at. What are those actionable needs and how do we target our resources more effectively? Here at Sanford, when we really started down this journey, it was back in about 2010. And we had um, our, our nurses at that time were called health coaches. And we've recently retitled them into RN care managers um, within our system. So we have about 120 um, RNs in our primary um, care clinics that do care management. And we have a newer role. So we have um, six different nurses that are integrated um, throughout our, our health system that are community care managers. So they're really kind of that bridge between our patients that maybe are seen a lot in our hospital system or our EDs, but they don't necessarily um, empanel themselves in primary care. And so um, we have them called community care managers where they're kind of that, that bridge um, between those services so we can link them back into to primary care. So we'll just give you a little background on some of our journey um, into this risk stratification model and really kind of our alignment with all of our other accrediting bodies. So probably very similar to many of you on the call. Um, we um, are Joint Commission certified um, within our health system. We have, oh, I'm gonna say this wrong. I believe we have 42 um, clinics that are healthcare home certified clinics um, that are border clinics. So we have a lot of sites that are um, right on the Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota border that we certify through MDH. We have um, a, a plethora of clinics that are South Dakota Medicaid home, um, Medicaid health home clinics in our South Dakota region. We have been part of the Compass Practice Transformation Network. Um, so that grant just ended um, at the end of September or is just ending here. And then our most recent journey um, is with Comprehensive Primary Care Plus. And we became a 2018 starter in this Medicare program, CPC Plus, um, really looking at value-based care and um, care management strategies and care delivery requirements. So we found that that Comprehensive Primary Care Plus program and our um, healthcare home program, the standards aligned um, very close together. Um, so we were, um, we were thankful for um, having uh, many of our clinics already healthcare home certified in the past because it was really much easier to bring in that comprehensive primary plus model into the clinic locations and get those clinics up and running. Jill, this is Carol. We're hearing some background noise. Is that uh, traffic or what are we hearing? It's you traffic. Guys, it's a motorcycle <laughs> outside my office window. Yes. So. <laughs> All right. So we'll we'll put up. I just wanted to acknowledge it. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize. And if there's an ambulance that goes by, it gets really loud too. So. Okay. It won't be too bad. Very odd. <laughs> So we really kind of, you know, we found that we risk stratified patients in many different ways. Um, so throughout this journey, we found that, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to identify your patients to say, how do we risk stratify them for what services and care management strategies um, they need. So we really use data um, to look at what that could be. So we have many, many registries built within our EMR. Um, we have the Healthy Planet platform um, within Epic. So we have many registries that are built. Um, we've worked with many of our, our payer and ACO contracts um, to look at different care management um, and risk needs with our patients. Um, through CMS, we look at the utilization data. Um, so we look at the identified um, high utilizers. Um, we can look at them. We can break it down by even diagnosis code to see at a clinic um, you know, which diagnosis is really kind of driving that utilization within our clinic locations. And then we also have what are called daily huddle sheets. So it's really those talking points we pull from our EMR um, to really engage and create that daily huddle structure within our clinics. Like I said, this is our data sources. So when we really started down um, this population health, care management strategies within our clinics, 
um, we really started by looking at registries, so doing that proactive outreach to our patients. Um, so we had many registries built on preventative screening, so colorectal cancer, mammogram, cervical cancer screening is one of our newest ones, and then adding on those chronic diseases. Um, we, have, we have hundreds of registries built out there, so we have many different ways that we can pull these patients. Um, and then, like I said before, our huddle sheets, um, they really will pull out, so they will dig into our EMR um, prior to our patients coming to the clinic and pull some of this, um, this health maintenance data out for us. So it's going to look at, you know, what was the last time our patient was weighed and what's their BMI? Uh, what does they, you know, what's their blood pressure like? What's it been trending like um, over the last couple of visits that they have been in? Um, for prediabetes, again, it's pulling in that BMI. It's maybe looking at their lab values over time. Um, so we can kind of watch that pre-diabetes or diabetes suspect patients when they come in. Um, same with asthma and same with anxiety. Um, so that's being a little bit proactive for us as we get prepared to see that patient in our clinic. So our risk stratification process at Sanford, um, it, it was it was built by us as a system. It's one of the care delivery requirements that we needed to have an infrastructure in place uh, for our CPC plus, uh, our CMS care model. Um, and we had to have that up and running um, by, so we had really kind of the first year of the program to get it up and going. So um, we started reporting out on that as of quarter four of 2018, so the end of last year. So. Our risk stratification is really an algorithm-based criteria, and that is um, the majority of it. We also have the opportunity to use clinical intuition to adjust that score, and I'll, I'll talk through that as we get into this a little bit more. So for our defined algorithm, um, we really looked at defined criteria. So you can look at doing this in many different ways um, within your clinic system. So you can, you can look at models out there and really kind of define what your criteria is. Um, from there, you will, you'll begin to start to categorize your patients into different risk levels. Um, I've seen models where they've used diagnoses and clusters. Um, we've seen some where they actually have um, claims-based data that they're able to pull into the algorithm. We've pulled everything from structured fields within our EMR, um, and it being automated is really a key. We've seen some models as we've gone, you know, through the, the CPC Plus um, education and um, worked with different systems out there, and there are some systems that are actually still using a paper copy um, of a risk um, stratification methodology. So we have all that algorithm built within our EMR, and, and I'll kind of get into what that looks like um, coming up here. Um, the second portion of how we created a risk stratification model within our clinic was pulling in clinical intuition. So we know that our EMR can't pull everything um, surrounding what the patient needs are. So we have a field within our, our um, physician um, visit notes and our care management visit notes where those care team members can actually modify the patient's risk score. And we do that based on what are their social needs, so um, looking at the social determinants of health screening for that patient. Looking at utilization that may be outside of our system. So we have many clinics that are small rural clinics and they're not always tied directly into a Sanford. Um, emergency room or hospital. So we know that sometimes we can't automate that capture of that utilization. Uh, what's that patient's health literacy? Um, how activated are they? <clears throat> that kind of ties into a big component of their actual engagement. Um, what's their caregiver support? Um, so do they live alone? Are they in a care facility? Um, what's that caregiver support like? And then what are the behavioral and medical needs of that patient that are outside of our algorithm? Um, so those are different things that our, our teams can use to adjust that score. 
So the next couple of slides will kind of get into what our actual criteria is and, and what that looks like. So we kind of broke it down into some different buckets. Um, so the first, the first thing that what we look at um, within our criteria is, is utilization. So for capturing the patient's hospital encounters um, within the past year, their ED encounters in the past year, and then those no-show office visits. So behind the scenes, our EMR is pulling all of that out and then calculating that score um, based on how many um, of these encounters they have had within the past year. We pull in different lab values. So um, we're looking at that hemoglobin A1C. So where is that setting at? Um, what's the patient's blood pressure? Um, what's that cardiovascular risk score? Some of our screening tools that we do. So we do the um, GAD and the PHQ-9. So we're, we're um, sending out questionnaires for patients to look at what is their anxiety level? Um, what's their depression? Um, questionnaire look like, so we're calculating those scores in, and then also their asthma control test or their ACT score. And then different diagnoses. So these are the chronic disease diagnoses that are built into the current state of our algorithm. Um, so does the patient have COPD, diabetes, CHF, um, any of these chronic diseases um, will pull into the patient's score. Other criteria we pull in, um, what's the patient's age? Um, what's their smoking status? So we're looking at tobacco and um, also non-tobacco. Um, so, you know, we're looking at um, smoking cigarettes. Um, we're looking at vaping. Um, all those different things are pulling into that smoking status. Um, and then the patient's BMI. So we're looking at that overall for the patient. Our look back period is one year, so we're looking back um, and pulling all these criteria together for the past year for this patient. So in the end, when we calculate everything out, we'll break it down into this, this pyramid that I have shown here. So um, we consider our high risk population to be that top 5% of patients. Uh, the medium risk criteria or the medium risk tier they fall into would be the next 20%. And then our low risk are 75% of our patient population. And what we did was once we built this, this criteria into our electronic medical record, we had our um, enterprise data analytics team. So they went and took all of the scores of all of our patients within our primary care clinics and then looked at what was that, um, what was the score of that top 5%, that medium 20% of patients, and that low risk. So that's how we were kind of able to break it down um, by scores for our patients. So this is a screenshot kind of showing you what it looks like. So like I said, we have EPIC, that's our, that's our EMR platform, and it's a Healthy Planet built report within our, our EMR. So we can run this panel based on the physician's panel of patients. So I can put in Dr. Jones and I can pull out all of the patients that are attributed or impaneled to Dr. Jones and then each patient um, will have their score show up on this registry. So then you can sort it by high risk, medium risk, low risk patients. Um, you can sort it highest to lowest, kind of however you want that to be. So as you hover over the red bubble of the 17, um, then this screenshot will show. So it will tell you how that patient scored out. Uh, so this patient, you can see they had a point based on the patient's age. Um, they had three points for hospital admissions in the last year, three for ED visits, two points for no-show. Um, so you can see how that goes, and then it will calculate up their, their complete score. Um, one of the biggest eye-openers, I think, for us is, is we knew patients had high utilization, but once we really started to look at this, um, if you see this patient here, um, had 31 ED visits in the past year. So we found that we needed to do a little bit of tweaking to our scores because we were, we were maxing out 
um, our utilization score at three points based on um, how many visits these patients had. So from there, that really takes us into kind of what's that care management structure and model that, that we have. And we, we've used our risk score, our risk stratification score, to really start to drive what does that care management model begin to look like um, for us at Stanford Health. So our overall goal with our patients is always that they can self-manage. So we know we aren't, we aren't going to cure them of chronic diseases, um, but we're going to hopefully get them to be able to have self-management within those disease processes. Um, working on looking at utilization with those patients and how can we begin to help them start to manage their own health care. So we kind of break our care management structure into, into different buckets of care. So um, number one is looking at risk stratification. So we can take that risk stratification score and we can pull it into the provider schedule. So when they're going through and looking at their patients that are coming in for the day, they can see right there what that risk stratification score is for their patients so they know if they have high risk, medium risk, or low risk patients coming in. Uh, for longitudinal care management, that's really our kind of long-term um, relationship-based care management with our patients. So we're creating that individual plan of care with that patient. We may be helping to refer them to different resources, making sure that they're linked up with the social worker or the behavioral health therapist within the clinic um, or the different resources sources that they may need. So dietitians, diabetic educators, um, whatever those ancillary services may be. We also have a group of patients we pull into what we call episodic care management. So we do post-hospital discharge outreach to all of our patients, so our goal is that we get a phone call to them within two days of discharge, and that that wraparound service is, a, is that they come into the clinic based on diagnosis within three to seven days post-hospital discharge. We've recently started a follow-up with um, our patients that have been in the emergency department. So our patients will get a phone call, a letter, or a message via um, their, their portal, their patient portal, um, within a week of an ED visit. And then our follow-up phone calls really for ED, we're, we're trying right now to just call our, our high-risk patients, um, otherwise it gets to be quite a list of people that we have each day, so right now the ED follow-up um, phone calls are really for those high-risk patients or patients that our care managers have recently worked with. Um, and then looking at those transitions in care. So if the patient is moving to a different level of care um, and what that may look like. So our care management program, like I said, we're really looking at supporting patient self-management, activation, um, looking for that awareness of community resources and social support. Our screening, um, for patients for social determinants of health or social care um, needs is something that we've really started to work on within the past year. So making sure that we're asking those patients those questions and um, we recently ha are having an upgrade to our EMR system and so we'll be able to actually deploy that out to patients um, via their, their patient portal also. Um, looking at coordinations or care transitions and follow up with that. Um, really wrapping that care team together, so understanding that it's not up to just the physician or their care manager as a nurse um, to coordinate everything with the patient, but kind of wrapping that care team together. Um, and then, like I said, review and re or receive and review timely information on our hospital, our emergency department, admissions and discharges, so that we're following up with those patients. We have all of our care managers um, trained in motivational interviewing. Um, we do a lot with agenda setting and goal setting too with our patients as we're getting ready and prepped for their visits. This kind of shows the different care team members that we have in our clinics, and this, this will vary. 
so like I said, we have some larger um, metro clinics within the bigger cities where our health system is, but we have some, some clinic locations that are very small. And they may only be open three days a week for half day um, at some of our very rural locations. So the care team members will vary based on kind of the location. So at the, the center is always the patient. So like I said, we have RN care managers in our clinics. So all of our care managers are registered nurses. We have panel assistants. So that's those panel managers. They're running the registries. They're making outreach to our patients. Um, the providers, the social workers, so we have recently, within the past year and a half, started integrating social workers within our clinics. Um, so they sit right in the same office as a care manager and um, the integrated health therapist, so they're a close-knit team that works together. We are currently getting more and more pharmacists within our clinics. Um, they are such an invaluable um, piece of the care team. I, I've just been amazed at some of the work that our pharmacists do. In our internal medicine clinics in one of our metro areas, they're actually doing our post-hospital discharge and med rec calls to patients. Um, so they have just been a really, a really wonderful piece of that, that team. Um, we've had our pharmacists take phone calls from patients if they call in with medication questions, if they call into our triage line. We've had them reach out and, and talk with the patient. Um, we've had some avoidable ED visits um, just based on that pharmacist outreach with our patients. We have integrated health therapists. So these are um, licensed independent social workers and um, they do our behavioral health triage therapy within our clinics. We have a community paramedic um, in, our, in our clinics within the Fargo. Um, area, we are currently um, getting more and more of those. And so we have found um, they are doing a lot of home visits to patients. They're coordinating closely with our community care manager, um, going out and seeing patients. Um, so I think I explained the community care manager earlier. Um, so they are really integrating into that community and seeing patients and helping them engage and become active with a primary care provider or clinic. Uh, we have a health guide. Um, it's a very similar role to a community health worker. Um, our health guide is a non-licensed individual um, and they are going out and working with patients, um, linking them to community services, linking them to resources. Um, they will go out and help teach patients how to ride the Metro bus system. If they say, I don't have access to get to the clinic, um, you know, I'm unable to get to my appointments, they'll go help them learn how to ride the bus. Um, so they're just a wonderful team member. And then we have a community health worker um, in one of our, our regions. Um, so we're really interested in getting more community health workers um, within the system also. So our care management, we really kind of group them into these low, medium, and high-risk panels of patients. So our low-risk patients, that's kind of really our, our panel assistant or care team associates. Um, they will work with those patients. They'll do the chronic disease registries, do the outreach to the patients, kind of round them up, make sure they're getting back into the clinic. Um, they're working our wellness registries, um, so looking at those proactive outreaches for patients for um, mammograms, colorectal cancer screenings, um, we've really defined workflows for these individuals, so we're even, we even have scripted phone calls for them, so they will call patients and do a follow-up um, depression screening with them um, or be able to schedule them in for um, whatever their services are that that patient may need. Our medium risk panel of patients, based on our risk stratification score, um, really have our frontline nursing staff really kind of own that group of patients. So. They are being real proactive and looking at preventative healthcare needs for the patients. Uh, they're providing patient education, making sure that their goals are flowing through to their after visit summary. Um, these individuals really run our daily huddle. They know the provider's schedule. They know where they can fit patients in. They're working closely with the providers all day. So they're kind of running that schedule and running that, that panel of patients for the day. 
Um, over to the right, you can see there's some, it's called a BMI gap card or diabetes gap card. So these are used a lot by our frontline staff. Um, if patients come in with one of these chronic diseases um, or they have a real high BMI, uh, the nurses can use these gap cards to really identify some of the outreach um, and some of the interventions that our care team needs for these patients. So um, they will start working on the gap card with the patient and then also leave it for the provider if there's um, anything the provider needs to address with the patient during that visit. And then our high-risk panel of patients. So like I said, that's really our care team members, our RN care managers, um, working together um, to make sure that this patient is receiving the appropriate level of care and care management services that they need. This is just a little screenshot of what our daily team huddle report looks like. Um, so like I said, it will, it will pull in some of the the demographics of the patient, it will pull in um, their last weight, their last height, if they have a specific blood pressure goal. Um, it will pull in some of those um, proactive or those health maintenance screenings that the patient has. So have they had their colonoscopy or are they overdue? It will pull in mammogram for patients um, if they need a lung screen done. And then the chronic diseases, it will pull in for the patient. There we go. Um, one of the really cool things that since we've implemented risk stratification, um, our clinic care teams have started doing um, a separate huddle um, for really a high risk assessment team. Um, so they are pulling together on a weekly basis to really kind of talk about who are the high risk patients in their clinic and what can they do for them. So the, the care team members that they are bringing in for these, this high-risk assessment team that meets each week um, is the community care manager, the clinic social worker. If we have a social worker within that clinic or if it's a shared social worker, um, they will be present at that team meeting. Uh, the care manager from within the clinic, our integrated health therapists, they work with our behavioral health patients, and sometimes our health guides will, will be part of this group. And like I said, they meet weekly. They review the high-risk patients, and um, they kind of go over really who's going to take point on this patient. So what are the needs of the patient and who's going to take point? Um, so each team member will review. So they'll pick two, different, two to three different patients each week um, to review. And um, the team members know of the patients prior so that they can review the patient. Um, the high-risk patient is really presented kind of almost like a case study, so they'll talk through the patient's demographics, what is their risk score, who is their primary care physician, you know, what are some of the upcoming appointments they have um, within primary care and then within our specialty care clinics also, and then what type of utilization is that um, patient using? So are they in the ED a lot, or are they in the clinic a lot, are they not coming to the clinic? Um, what does that look like? Um, and then also coordinating with the community teams for these patients. They come up with kind of this high-risk action plan. So what are the top things we want to work on with this patient? What's our target date? Who's taking points? So who is that responsible person? So it might be the social worker because there's some unmet social needs of that patient that we need to really address before we can move into um, some of the other needs with them. Um, each month, this high-risk team will go back and review the previous patients so they can complete that action plan and they can have a complete date in there and then some of the outcomes of these patients. Um, they'll talk about their current health status, um, figure out what ongoing needs these patients have. Um, they continue to really evaluate and um, kind of figure out the effectiveness of how their care coordination is going within the clinic, and are we improving the health outcomes of the patient? So, like I said, it's kind of a new process that we're really starting to onboard in our different clinics, um, but we're seeing some really good results from this. Um, so, some of the future enhancements that we have. So that really kind of talks about, you know, what is our care management structure? 
um, how do we identify our patients? So we're taking that risk stratification score and then really implementing it into the care management structure and strategies within our clinic. Um, we've, had, we've had our risk score live um, for a year. I think it was a year this week, actually, was our goal live date with it. So it was, it was September of 2018. And so we have been meeting as a team to really look at refining what that is, because when we first launched it, we had a lot of feedback for different things to kind of add and to finesse that criteria a little bit. So um, we are going to increase our look back period, especially for chronic diseases and some of those lab values to two years. Um, our, our utilization, so hospital and ED admissions, we're going to keep at that one year mark. Um, we know that we're probably not scoring some of our patients high enough on utilization right now, like that example I showed where the patient had 31 ED visits um, and, and they were maxing out at points at three. So we're kind of finessing some of that. Um, we're looking at polypharmacy, so how many, how many patients have a high number of, of prescription medications. Um, for some of the chronic conditions, we've had some asks to look at certain things like chronic kidney disease, you know, could we base points um, based on the um, the stage of disease that those patients are at. Um, pediatric criteria, we have a whole separate team that's really looking at a separate risk stratification and risk scoring system for our pediatric patients. Within our family medicine clinics right now, our current risk score really just, it doesn't pull in a lot of the, the pediatric measures that we need. Um, we are seeing some successes with some of our, you know, 16 to 18 year old patients that are pulling in. Um, based on chronic diseases um, and diagnoses for them. And then that social determinants of health. We've had a lot of asks if we could build that into the score and, and what could that look like. So we've done some work with that. So we are able at this point to screen our patients for social determinants of health based on the epic build of those um, social history questions. And so um, we've looked at being able to pull that total score in to the risk stratification score that we have. The more we've kind of dug into that, the more I think we're probably going to keep them separate and then just really use, continue to use that social um, care aspects for really that um, ability to adjust that risk score on our own. So this is kind of some of the references that we used, um, some of the different articles and different models that we use to, to build our system off of. And so I think from here, we're open to questions. All right, Jill, wow, that was great. Um, Dorothy, do we have any questions that have come in over the chat function? Yes, we have one. I can read it to you. It's, uh, do you utilize the chronic care management code to bill for your services? We do not. We've had a lot of discussion recently around that, and we currently um, have one of our clinic locations that is going to start piloting using the chronic care management code, and so we're doing some epic build um, to be able to track that, so to be able to track those 20 minutes and um, all those different criteria that we need for them. So we don't, um, but I'm hoping a year from now I can say that we do. We'll check back. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've got a couple of questions, and um, others, we still have about five to eight minutes left on this webinar, so please, if you do have a question, feel free to submit it. In the meantime, I'd like to go back to this, the whole data thing. Um, so it's amazing how much data you're able to pull out of your system now. Um, who is looking at that data? Because, you know, it's one thing to have data, and it's another to analyze and work with it. Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So within our, our clinics, we have quality improvement advisors that are really assigned to our different clinic systems. So we have, we have quality improvement advisors for primary care, for specialty care systems, um, or clinic locations. And so they are really our, our data gurus. So they will look at, you know, what are our scores for our overall depression screening or our colorectal cancer screening and then they are assigned to different clinics and so they work with those clinical teams. Um, so they will give them back the data at the end of every month or every quarter 
um, and then work with teams um, within our clinic um, on if there would be anything special, like if the clinic was um, starting to struggle with their um, outreach for colorectal cancer screening, then that quality improvement team will, will work with that clinic on that. Um, we have visibility boards in our clinic, so we're really transparent with our data. Some clinics actually have their data um, posted in their clinic lobby. Some of them have them in their hallways so patients can see it as they go by, um, back and forth to exam rooms, and then some of our clinics have it more like in a break room, so it, it really kind of varies based on what the location is comfortable with. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, so, and I, I, I noticed that one of the uh, one of the comments that you made is that it's really important to automate, and and I get that um, to automate your data collection and analysis for the the smaller clinics. Though, I mean, you have a lot of smaller clinics in your in your orbit as well. Um, how are they? They're they're still in your system and. Can you give any uh, advice to smaller independent clinics who may not be part of a big system and have access to the kind of data collection tools that you do? Yeah, and so we really drive our data collection from our EMR. So I think for, for systems that are on an electronic EMR, it's really finding the way to do that. And, and we've been on EPIC, I believe it was 2011, is when Sanford went live. And even at the beginning of that, we didn't, we didn't pull data real, not necessarily accurately, but maybe we didn't use the system as much as we could have. So, you know, we had many different ways that we were pulling and extracting and creating spreadsheets. And, and you know, so we've kind of come a long way um, with our system over time. But I think using your electronic EMR to the best that you can is really, um, important to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, Dorothy, anything come in? Oh, yes, we have two more questions. The first question is, what criteria is looked at for the pediatric risk strat stratification? So right now, the, pedi the, uh, the, the children in our clinics, we are we're pulling a risk score on patients, on anyone that's attributed to, so if it's a family practice location and there's an eight-year-old, um, they're probably gonna get a risk score of zero, zero based on our criteria right now. Um, so we don't have a separate pediatric score built at this time, but we do have a pediatric intensivist doctor that is in the process of starting to create what and you know, a pediatric criteria could look like separate from the adult criteria. So we do have some of our, I've, I've seen a 16 year old come out pretty high risk. It, um, it was an individual that had a higher BMI. They had diabetes. I think there was some depression and there was quite a bit of utilization. So a lot of ED utilization for this patient and I think an admission or two um, so they actually kicked out as high risk um, in one of our clinics. But okay. nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I just was saying we don't really have anything specific to just our pediatric population built yet. Once again, we'll check back in a year. Dorothy, we had one more question. Uh, yeah, it's a, a kind of a two-parter. It says, what is the role of CHW in your system, and do you do SWs provide functions of care management? So CHW, we have we have one community health worker, and they are in one of our northern Minnesota regions where we have several clinics, and so that community health worker really kind of works similar to um, the role I described as kind of a community care manager. So they work a lot with, um, we have patients that in that region that a lot of them are on an Indian reservation. And so our community health worker can kind of help integrate those services back and forth to these patients. They work a lot with community um, resources for patients and um, they will accompany them to clinic appointments at times. Um, so that's really, really what that role is doing. 
And I think the second part of that was asking about the social workers. So we are, we currently, we have some grants, and so we are getting more and more social workers, and they, um, for the most part, we try and co-locate them, if we can, within our clinics. And so they actually sit in office um, right within our clinic team. So they're with our, um, their, our, our health therapists, integrated health therapists, our, our care managers, our nurses, um, and then the social worker is in there. And so they meet with a lot of patients if they have housing issues, um, if they need services that they need to help coordinate with, whatever those um, social care issues may be, um, they really incorporate in as part of that healthcare team. All right, well, we are out of time, and so I'd like to start by thanking Jill. And as we close things up, I've got just a couple of announcements for you. Um, within the next month, look for a new e-learning course on risk stratification, where you'll be able to go back and reference a lot of the information that you heard today and additional resources to get started with your own risk stratification. If you haven't already done so, check out the Foundations of Care Coordination course, which was introduced over the summer. And whether you're just getting started with care coordination or introducing new members to the care coordination concept, this is a great starting place. If you haven't visited the Healthcare Home Learning Center lately, the MDH Learning Center lately, you'll notice a new look and feel and some new features and some changes that will include, improve your functionality and navigation um, on, on the site. Slides from this webinar and past webinars are posted on the Healthcare Home website where you can also get recordings of the webinars on the MDH YouTube channel. To find those, go to the home page of the Healthcare Home website top right corner. You'll see the YouTube link there. Receive a certificate of attendance for participating in today's webinar. Complete the evaluation that will be emailed to you following this webinar. Thanks once again, Jill, for being with us today. And thanks to all of you for being a part of our Healthcare Home Learning community. We learn best when we learn from each other, so if you have ideas or information to share, please be sure to reach out to us. We do love hearing from you. Thank you. Have a great day.